This is the second in a series of presentations covering the structure of the universe from its smaller subatomic particles to its large scale structure. The previous presentation showed some of the properties that all the particles could have if they were composed of photons of the appropriate energy making two revolutions per wavelength. That got us started on the journey to understand the universe. Along the way, it actually united the structures of subatomic particles with the special relativity corrections. This presentation reveals the structure and properties of the only four long-term stable particles, the electron, the proton, the neutron, and neutrinos. That lays the foundation for all the structures of the universe upon which the future presentation will expand our understanding of it. While I'm introducing the electron, this slide is a reminder of some of the properties that particles making two revolutions per wavelength will have. Now just remember them. There will be no need for me to introduce them when describing the properties of the individual particles. The concept that all matter was made of small indivisible particles first originated in what is now India about 900 BCE. It was introduced to Europe in the 5th century BCE when the Greek philosopher Democritus described those particles as atomos, the Greek word for indivisible. After centuries of neglect, in around about 1800 CE, an English chemist, John Dalton, revived the concept of separate indivisible particles making up all matter. He noted that different types of indivisible atoms were needed to explain his chemical observations. They were still regarded as indivisible. The electron's discovery by J.J. Thompson at the Cavendish Lab, Cambridge, created great excitement. In isolating and identifying electrons as part of atoms, journalists at the time described Professor Thompson as the first person to split the atom. Since its discovery, there were many attempts to explain the properties of the electron. In 1918, Sir Arthur Compton described it as a ring of electricity subject to rotation. Many attempts were made to model the electron. Its behavior defied all previous attempts at modeling it. Indeed, the behavior of electrons was so unusual that in the 1960s, some physicists found the electron's behavior so bizarre, they asked if it really was a particle. And attempts to explain the structure it included the electron was a spinning sphere, it was shaped like an amoeba, and it could change its size and shape to match different situations. The most common way around that problem was the method adopted by Dirac and Schrodinger. They described it by wave functions. After all, by 1927, Davison and Germer and G.P. Thompson had verified de Broglie's predictions that particles had wave properties. Since then, experimentalists have measured the dimensions of electrons and found them to be point particles with a diameter as small as 10 to the minus 18 meters. That gave rise to the standard model of an electron as a point particle with properties attached, usually as a mathematical expression. When making calculations, those properties are included in them. It is good for mathematical calculations, but doesn't give you any indication of what is actually happening. In the following, I'm going to present the structure of an electron as a photon of the appropriate energy, making two revolutions per wavelength. It comes with all the appropriate properties like charge, magnetic moment, mass, spin, dimensions, the Broyle wavelength, special relativity corrections, and chirality inbuilt. Before that can be done, it is necessary to list some of their measured properties. Here you see the electron's properties of mass, charge, spin, magnetic moment, and measured diameters. They are all measured values, so they must be correct. Under this model, its mass gives its rotating photons these rest properties of frequency, wavelength, and radius. These are what you would expect from this model. The most obvious difference is between the rest radius and the measured diameters. For that, we need look no further than derivations of the special relativity corrections. The radius decreases as its velocity increases with energy input. A very simple calculation shows that the radius of an electron would be approximately as measured in the energies indicated. Under other models, that could give theoreticians some justification for considering an electron as a point particle. Under this model, it is only a point particle at those high energies. So what would an electron look like if you were to see it? 
Or more specifically, how should an electron be modelled? At rest, it looks something like this. The electric charge is generated at the rotating photon circumference with a radius of about 1.93 by 10 to the minus 13 metres and its plane of rotation. The electric field is carried into the third dimension away from the rotating photon. It is primarily the magnetic field that gives the electron its third dimension. But nowhere is there something that is solid. This model also gives support to Compton's 1918 statement that an electron is a ring of electricity subject to rotation. Well, that's what an electron looks like at rest. When they move, the spiral action gives their circumference a very different appearance. Diagram C shows the trajectory of a slowly moving electron, a few tens of keV. The circumference and charge slowly spiral their way through space. There were suggestions that motions had been detected in helical Mott scattering. D is an attempt to show that fast moving electrons have their mass increase and their spiral radius decrease. As an illustration, if C represents an electron in the KeV energy range, D would represent an electron in the MeV energy range. By the time electrons were accelerated to GeV and TeV energies, their trajectory would be a straight line on these scales. And that diminution of radius has definitely been detected. As mentioned before, at TeV energies, they present a scattering cross-section of approximately 10 to the minus 18 metres. Perhaps some experimentalists like to try and verify that diminution of radius at increasing energy by carrying out a series of scattering experiments in the KEV to TEV range. I hope that gives you an indication of some of the properties of the electron under this model. It shows that when an electron is accelerated to different speeds, its mass increases, its electric charge remains the same, and its field decreases. And mass increases because of special relativity corrections with increasing speed. Electric charge does not change because the angular momentum of half h-bar doesn't change. Its magnetic moment decreases because its radius decreases. But that isn't the only way this model shows how electrons respond to different situations. Get a beam of spin polarized electrons into close proximity and their magnetic moment fields will hold them against the like charge repulsion of their negative fields as shown here in A. They will travel in unison as if one particle. Another situation is the wave properties of electrons. Although their rest radius is 1.93 times 10 to the minus 13 meters, their motion automatically generates their de Broglie wave, as previously indicated in the last presentation. They are shown in B. The moving electron generate disturbances in the electric permittivity and magnetic permeability as indicated by the curves associated with the electrons. They are just like any other electromagnetic wave. They travel at C and their wavelength diminishes inversely with the electron's speed. I suggested the actual oscillations travel at C, but are otherwise just like an N wavelength photon as it illustrated here in diagram C. The moving electron generates an oscillation that starts out small, rises to a maximum of the electron's position of n over 2 wavelengths before diminishing back to zero again after n wavelengths. It is first that this suggests that the intensity of the E and B field diminishes with distance d from the central axis according to the inverse exponential at the position of their intensity c naught along the n oscillation. They are not simple idea to understand. They involve group and phase velocities, variable intensities, and possibly circular polarization. They are best summarized by lambda equals h over p, but they do have very real effects. Those waves have been detected in electron diffraction and interference experiments. Diffraction is just like photon diffraction. The closer the wave gets to the diffraction edge, the greater will be the angle of diffraction. Electrons are also diffracted with regular crystalline surfaces. That was how Davison and Germer and G.B. Thompson first discovered their wave behavior. It's very much a case of the electron, moving electron produces the wave, and then the wave tells the electron how to move. When electron diffraction patterns are seen in electron microscopes, so we all know the waves exist. Interference is a different situation. 
The electron is a particle and can only travel through one slit. A is an illustration of an electron complete with this de Broglie wave approaching a double slit. B shows the wave passing through the double slit in the normal manner associated with photon waves. Note the positive interference. And here I'm going to quote from Einstein, mass distorts space-time, space-time tells mass how to move. The same principle applies to individual particles. A moving particle generates waves, the waves tell particles how to move. However, the electron is a particle and can only pass through one of the slits. In C, it is shown as passing through the upper slit. The reinforcements of the positive inter interference guide the electron to those regions that generate the inter interference pattern which will be detected on the screen. Next, consider what happens when an attempt is made to monitor a slit to find out which slit the electron passes through. For that purpose, you need to put a detector on one slit. This is shown in this diagram. The act of placing a detector on one slit alters the nature of the wave that emerges from that slit. It does not matter whether the electron or its wave function passes through the slit. The presence of the detector alters the wave function. Diagrams D and E show that different waves do not produce an interference pattern. It does not matter whether the electron passes through the numbered slit or whether the wave passes through it. It is the act of doing something to one of the slits that alters the phase of that portion of the wave that passes through that slit. It is that alteration that prevents an interference pattern from being observed. Another effect of the de Boyle wave is to spread the electromagnetic wave associated with an electron over a larger area. When measured, it could make the electron look much larger than it actually is. That can make a low voltage electron look as if they have the dimensions of the order of a nanometer. With electrons behaving like point particles with dimensions of 10 to the minus 18 meters at very high energy and at 10 to the nine meters at low energy, it's hardly surprising that modeling them was difficult. It is hoped this presentation resolves those issues. There are a lot more to the properties of electrons that need to be discussed. Some of them will be covered later when dealing with the properties of atoms. Now it is time to look at protons. Rutherford was the first to propose that atoms had electrons moving around a dense positive nucleus. By sending alpha particles through a thin gold foil, Geiger and Marsden were able to verify Rutherford's suggestions. Measurements showed that the nucleus was not all positive charge. The mass of heavier nuclei was about double that of the mass of a hydrogen atom nucleus. The concept of nuclei being composed of positive particles and neutral particles was developed. The positive component was called a proton. Details of proton under this rotating photon model are now presented. Measurements of some of these properties are shown here. Charge and spin are as predicted. The mass of the proton is as measured. It can be expressed in many different ways. The mass of many subatomic particles is often referred to by its energy equivalent, in this case, 938.27, etc., MeV per C squared. Its magnetic moment is nearly three times what is predicted under this model. The accuracy of the mass, charge, and magnetic moments show that modern experimentalists are pretty damn good. Here are some properties predicted by the rotating photon based upon the proton's measured mass. It includes a circularly polarized proton with a spin of h-bar. That would be what's called the intrinsic spin of the, the proton. It comes from this model of the photon used as the derivation of general particle properties. This model requires that a charged particle and a neutral particle must have an intrinsic spin difference of half h-bar. It will be shown later, this is what is actually observed. The discrepancies are the measured root mean square charge radius is about eight times larger than the theoretically predicted value of 0.105 fm. Its measured magnetic moment is almost 2.8 times larger than predicted. They are significant variations within themselves. However, compared to the dimensions and the magnetic moment of an electron, which is almost 2,000 times larger, the differences are quite small. Nevertheless, they exist and need to be explained. 
The easiest way to explain differences is to get some more information about the proton. Curve two in this diagram shows the experimentally determined plot of relative charge density with a pro of a proton versus distance from its center. It was determined using elastically scattered 188 MeV electrons. Curve two is what is called normalized. The intensities were spread all the way around the center. The normalization involves summing all the radial intensities and placing them on one curve. The linear intensity at 1 fm would spread out over four times the area of a linear intensity at 0.5 fm. Similarly, the intensities at 2 fm would make up eight times that of 0.5 fm. Summing them all into one radius makes it easier to visualize what is happening. Under the rotating photon theory, all the charge would be emitted at the circumference of 0.105 fm. Curve 1 is a straight line at 0.105 fm. It shows that the major feature of the experimental measurement is at 0.105 fm. That indicates there is a very great similarity between the rotating photon model of matter for a proton and experimental measurements. It's a good start for a theory. Taking the approach that the measured charge density would decrease exponentially from a radius of 0.105 fm, we would expect the measured intensity to be as illustrated in curve four. When that was normalized, it would be something as shown in curve three. Note that below 0.105 fm, the measured curve two goes to zero at the proton center. In my introduction to the general properties of particles under this rotating photon model, I mentioned that the particles had to orient themselves so that the plane of rotation of primary photon was perpendicular to its direction of travel. Curve T going to zero charge at the proton center is a dead giveaway that the charge distribution is planar or cylindrical. And if it's not, you can't get a zero at the center. And a zero at the center is very typical of cylindrical or circular charges. Further, there's no charge in the center and it is being viewed from its axis perpendicular to that charge. More accurate measurements could detect the charge reaching zero before the center. They may even detect a slight internal negative charge due to the rotating photon's negative field inside the outer positive charge. I have no idea whether that's been measured or not. Curves two or three are drawn going to zero at the center because of the limits of the measurements in curve two. Curve three would give a measured FWHM, or full width half maximum charge radius of approximately 0.2 fm, still below the measured value of 0.84 fm. For that solution, we must now look at the other discrepancy, the proton's magnetic field. In this model, a particle's magnetic moment is its radius h bar over 2 mc multiplied by unit electric charge. That worked quite well for the muon and the electron. It is, it is not working so well for the proton. The suggestion is that the electron and muon waves are sinusoidal in nature. When curved, they form a circle with radius h bar over 2 mc. A proton's larger magnetic moment suggests that at least two possibilities. One is that the electromagnetic wave that is the rotating photon is not entirely sinusoidal. Another is that the frequencies are so great that rotations vibrate, setting up other harmonic frequencies. They may well indeed be the same thing. This slide shows an example of a sinusoidal wave, one, x sin omega t, wave in black, where x is its amplitude. For the purpose of this exercise, that wave is traveling along axis four at speed c. The proton's basic wavelength is 1.321 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. That is 4 pi times 0.105 times 10 to the 15 meters. Consider the situation where its base is not linear, sort of vibrating a bit. The base moves with y sine one third omega two and is shown in two wavelengths here in blue. Its wavelength is 3.963 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. The actual proton wave is the sum of the two, so x sine omega t plus y sine one third omega t, shown here in red. 
The important feature to note is the one-third frequency component. So why did I pick one-third and not some other fraction? To show this, we need to have a look at properties of sine waves. They're the ideal wave. It's nice and regular. What happens when you disturb that regularity in a regular way? Here, we have simply cut off the wave's extremities, top and bottom, while still a regular wave is no longer sinusoidal, which brings us to an interesting feature. Sine waves with three times the periodicity or one third the property will always be a first approximation to the change from a regular sinusoidal oscillation. Note that whenever the red line is not sinusoidal, the blue line moves in the opposite direction to it compared to the base. The blue sine curve is subtracting some from the black sine curve to make it look more like the red curve, a distorted sine curve. Adding the blue curve to the red curve gives a first approximation to the black sine curve. Not shown here for brevity, a series of further one-third harmonics with the appropriate amplitude will restore a regularly distorted sine wave to a regular sine wave. They are the one-third, one-ninth, one-twenty-seventh, one-eighty-first, and so forth. That applies to both frequency and wavelength oscillations. In the proton situation, those fractional frequencies are multiples of wavelength. They are also sinusoidal. Any variation in the basic oscillation, omega curve 1 in diagram A, would produce curve 2 of one-third omega frequency oscillation. In the same way that the basic omega oscillation is producing a circular oscillation of radius 0.105 fm, the one-third omega oscillation would produce a circular oscillation of radius 0.315 fm. This slide shows some expected results from one-third harmonic or p slash 3 oscillations. They are circular with three times the radius of the central core, which is shown in diagram A. In order for that to occur, the proton's basic omega frequency, referred to as p slash 1, would have to give up some of its energy as it produced some one-third omega wavelength oscillations. These are referred to as p slash 3. Or as shown here in B, it would appear for a short time period and generate three P slash three oscillations. Conservation of spin, charge and mass means the process is neither straightforward nor random. Not all the P slash three oscillations can be positive. Diagram C shows another possibility according to the conservation laws of spin, charge and mass. It also has the right mass and spin for a proton, but its total charge is minus E. Because each one-third harmonic generates charge E during its existence, there must be an average of one negative oscillation for each two positive oscillations generated. Conservation of mass and charge means that one negative oscillation is produced each time two positive oscillations are produced. So while the combinations of A and B contain all of the mass and charge of the proton, it doesn't include the central core. Its charge does not spread out to match the observed charge distribution. Its magnetic moment is too high. To match the charge distribution and magnetic moment with all the other properties, it is necessary to play mix and match with a combination of one third series of frequency harmonics. This table lists some of the, the properties of the basic proton designated P1 and each of the one-third frequency harmonics P slash 3, P slash 9 and P slash 27 for the one-third, one-ninth and one-twenty-seventh frequencies respectively. Note that they have all the same spin of half h-bar and charge e. From then on, as the harmonic oscillation increases, the magnetic moment increases and the mass decreases, both linearly with the harmonic. The task is to find out what combinations of these one-third harmonic series can match the proton's observed magnetic moment and electric charge distribution. Diagram D again shows charge distributions to be matched. This combination must be done in such a way that all the proton's properties are conserved. The combination of all masses must never exceed 938.272 MeV per C squared. 
total charge must always be plus E and spin must be half h-bar. Its magnetic moment must increase the Bohr's magnetron EH-bar over 2MC to 2.793697, etc., times the Bohr magnetron. It must also be done in such a way that it matches the observed charge distribution shown here. Well, as well as the P slash 1 and P slash 3 harmonics, there are also P slash 9 or 1 ninth harmonics to consider. A shows a combination of three positive P slash 9 oscillations that come from replacing a positive P slash 3 oscillation. B shows a combination of one positive P slash 9 oscillations with two negative P slash 9 oscillations that could also replace a positive P slash 3 oscillation. In the same manner, a negative P slash 3 oscillation can be replaced by two positive P slash 9 oscillations and one negative oscillation. In this way, spin and mass are retained. The P slash 9 oscillations are required to match the proton's measured charge distribution and magnetic moment. Their maximum lateral extent is about the diameter from the perimeter of the P slash 3 oscillations from where they originate. That gives the maximum lateral extent of charge generated in a proton of approximately 2.4 fm. And even at that distance, it would be very weak. These various harmonic oscillations are literally popping into and out of existence while always maintaining the proton's basic properties of mass, spin, magnetic moment, and charge, as well as charge distribution. Their popping in and out is restricted to the plane of generation of a P1 oscillation. Although the electric charge is generated at the circumference of these rotating oscillations, the oscillations are spread out over all the area they can occupy. That gives a plane of electric charge in which the positive oscillations always outweigh the negative oscillations by a ratio of 2 to 1 apart from the central one. The charge then diminishes exponentially with the distance from the circumference of the P slash 9 oscillations. The magnetic field is generated by the rotating oscillations. Although the P slash 9 oscillation generates nine times the magnetic strength of a fundamental P slash 1 oscillation, its magnetic field is spread out over 81 times that the area. The magnetic field density will always be strongest in the particle center. From then on, it becomes a mix and match numbers exercise. Add the various combinations of P slash 1, P slash 3, and P slash 9 oscillations together until a match is obtained between the percentages of the different oscillations of the photons measured properties of charge, mass, spin, and charge distribution. One such match is given in this table. The cross symbol in the percent columns indicates that other combinations are possible to match those properties. The high values of the P slash 9 magnetic field means that its contribution needs to be small in the range of 7.5, perhaps plus or minus 2% of the total oscillations. The percent values apply to both mass and charge. This is done because every two positive oscillations are matched by one negative oscillation, except for the primary P slash 1 oscillation. It is 100% positive. It's also done in such a way that those properties plus spin and magnetic moment match the observed charge distribution. Now, this has been an approximate calculation designed to show it is possible for a series of one-third harmonic oscillations of the fundamental photon frequency to get results that come close to matching the measured proton properties. It's suggested about one-third of the proton is made up of the central P slash 1 core. Almost 60% is the P slash 3 harmonic oscillations, and about 7% is the outer P slash 9 oscillation. Enough information has been provided for any interested party to fine tune the calculation to get a closer match. That suggests that a proton's magnetic moment is, is not constant. It is suggested that the experimentally measured value is the long term average. No indication is given of what is that averaging time. Well, that raises the question of what would a proton look like if it could be visualized? Or, more specifically, how should a proton be modeled? Diagram A shows a side view of a proton. Its electric charge is in the plane in the middle, 
It has a high charge density in the middle and tapers off to zero at about 2.5 fm. The field generated by the charge spreads into the third dimension. The magnetic field is entirely in the third dimension. Nowhere is there some solid object like a billiard ball that contains the mass that carries the electric and magnetic fields with it. The protons, mass, spin, charge and magnetic moment are the electromagnetic field illustrated in A. There is nothing else. Diagram B gives a better indication of the proton's planar charge distribution. It is an oblique presentation in which the height is charge density, not spatial distribution. It shows a central core of approximately 0.2 fm diameter that has about one third of the proton's charge and mass. That is followed by the P3 regions containing about half the proton's charge and extends out to about 0.4 fm. Exponential charge reduction will bring that down to merge with the P slash 9 oscillations at about 1.2 fm. They extend out to about 2.4 fm as a very weak charge. After that, the exponential decay of the weak positive charge probably ends about 2.5 fm. That should be compared with the insert C. It's again the experimentally measured charge distribution. Differences are due to different vertical scales for charge density. The measured charge distribution is normalized with all charge shown on one axis, while this drawing is the charge spread out over the full 360 degrees. And of course, my limited drawing skills don't actually help. When protons move, they travel with their rotating photons plane spiraling through space. In that way, they present their rotation plane and hence charge distribution perpendicularly to their direction of motion. When moving in a particle accelerator, they would present their charge plane to any probe. This illustration shows that charge plane and some of the components that generate it. This schematic illustration shows there are two positive and one negative oscillations in both the P slash 3 and P slash 9 harmonics. It would not be surprising to hear that two positive and one negative oscillations had been detected near the proton center. At a radius of about 0.3 fm, it's possible that the P slash 9 oscillations are too weak to be detected by probing electrons. However, their average influence would be detected. These three images of protons will help considerably in understanding nuclear physics and the structure of nuclei. Diagram A shows the charge in the plane that is generated by the rotating harmonics of the fundamental photon frequency. That distribution is not continuous over short times. The circles indicate they are made up of two positive oscillations and one negative oscillation. Mm -hmm. These appear and disappear at different places. The average is that the charge is uniform and planar over a long time. One possible instantaneous appearance is shown by these curves. Well, they're not quite planar. I mean, these oscillations are buffeting each other so that the plane and the oscillations vibrate or ripple into the third dimensions. They're not these stable little things sitting there behaving themselves like ordered children. No, they're... Uh, they're moving about quite a lot. My favorite image of a proton is diagram C. It shows an oblique view of the central disk of positive charge, very strong in the center and progressively and non-linearly diminishing to about 2.4 fm radius from the center. The whole structure is surrounded by its magnetic field that gives it the three dimensions. Protons are entirely electromagnetic in nature with the electric field in a plane and the magnetic field perpendicular to that plane. I will show later that these oscillations have been detected. They play large roles in the generation of elementary particles, that is, those produced by cosmic rays and particle accelerators. They also play a large role in nuclear binding. Remembering them will greatly help in the understanding of nuclear binding and the structure and properties of nuclei. Now it's time for the neutron. As mentioned in the introduction to the proton, measurements after the discovery of the dense central core of nuclei soon led researchers to know that there was a lot more mass in nuclei than just protons. 
Chadwick's 1932 discovery of a neutral particle with about the same mass as a proton overcame that problem. The particles were called a neutron. Some of the measured properties are shown here. It's zero electric charge and spin J equals half H bar R as expected under the rotating photon model. The neutron's measured mass is what it is, and it gives rise to the neutron's frequency and wavelength values. As with a proton, the differences are in the radius and magnetic moment. The measured radii are over eight times the theoretically predicted radii. A nucleon has a magnetic moment when it should be zero because it has zero charge. Under this model, zero charge means that it must be a plane polarized photon. More specifically, it means that there must be an intrinsic spin difference of h-bar between the rotating photons that of the proton and the neutron. That difference has been detected. By convention, the standard model describes a proton as having zero intrinsic spin and the neutrons as having h-bar in intrinsic spin. However, the difference is still h-bar. To find out the reason for the differences between charge distribution and magnetic moment, we must again look at the neutron's measured relative charge distribution. It is shown here, curve one, with a proton's relative charge distribution, curve two. The heights have been adjusted to the same scale. Both sets of curves have been normalized to display all the charge at the distance projected onto one radial line. Like the proton, the neutron has a positive core of radius 0.105 fm. It doesn't reach as high as that of a proton and drops to a negative below 0.3 fm. Its negative reaches a maximum at about 0.5 fm and rises to a positive again at about 1.2 fm, where it remains until going off scale at 2 fm. Following the approach taken for the proton, the oscillations of a series of one-third harmonics were evaluated and a number and distribution as schematically illustrated were calculated and evaluated until a match between all properties was obtained. Diagram A of this slide shows a plane polarized photon curving in the direction of the blue arrow as it prepares to make two revolutions per wavelength. In the first half wavelength, the positive field will be on the outside that generates the central positive core and the one ninth harmonic oscillations in which the positive charge dominates. In the second half cycle, the negative charge is on the outside. It generates the one third and one twenty seventh harmonic oscillations in which the negative charge dominates. The polarities of those half cycles are shown here in B. Just as in the case of a proton, these oscillations will generate circular oscillations in the plane of a primary rotating photon, designated n slash 1. Diagram C shows a plan view of those oscillations, superimposed upon the charge distribution, which is red for positive and blue for negative. Due to size restrictions, the 127th oscillations are, are drawn to size, but originating well within their limits. Their outer circumference can extend to about 5.5 fm. The neutrons n slash 1 and n slash 9 oscillations are both positive and together generate a plus half unit electric charge. In order to match the neutron's negative magnetic moment, it was necessary to invoke a negative n slash 27 oscillation. Without that, the neutron just can't have a strong negative magnetic moment. Together, the neutrons n slash 3 and n slash 27 oscillations generate a minus half negative charge. From conservation principles, the one third harmonic oscillations will regularly generate an opposite polarity oscillation. It is shown in the n slash 3, n slash 9, and n slash 27 oscillations. Probing could detect two negative and one positive charge segment near the neutron center. Like the two positive and one negative oscillation in the proton, they would show up as having a radius of about 0.3 fm. It is uncertain whether probing would detect the much weaker n slash 9 oscillations, let alone the n slash 27 oscillations. However, as shall be shown later, the n slash 9 oscillations, like the p slash 9 oscillations, have been independently detected 
and there is very strong evidence for the existence of the N-27 oscillation. These will be covered later. The upper table shows the properties each of the different one-third harmonic oscillations would have. For each harmonic oscillation, the spin and charge remain the same. The radius and magnetic moment increase and the mass decreases, all linearly under the harmonic number. The lower table shows a combination of the different harmonic oscillations required to approximately match the neutron's measured magnetic moment and charge distribution. The symbol in the percent column again indicates that other values are possible. There is only a limited range of values that can match a neutron's magnetic moment and charge distribution and also comply with all other conservation requirements. As mentioned earlier, the neutron's N-27 harmonica oscillation is required to match its negative weak magnetic moment. It also means that the neutron must have a weak negative charge outside it. In its entirety, it will be less than minus 0.1 E and spread out over an ever-decreasing intensity to about 5.5 FM. Its effect can be detected by comparing neutron scattering measurements of nuclei diameter against charged particle scattering measurements of the same nuclei, but that's another story. That brings us to what a neutron should look like if you could see one or more specifically. What structure would, should you use when modelling neutrons? Diagram A shows a side-on view of a neutron. Its charge plane is vertically expanded and sectioned down the middle to show more detail. Further information about the charge plane is shown in this oblique representation in slide B. Again, vertical distances represent intensity, not spatial distributions. Its positive core is almost the same as a proton's positive core. The negative core surrounding it is made up of one-third frequency harmonics, which are dominantly negative. In turn, it is surrounded by the one-ninth frequency harmonics, which are again dominantly positive and make up about one-eighth of the proton's charge. Surrounding that is the 127th harmonic oscillation that can extend out to about 5 FM. They are dominantly negative charge and are the main contributors to the neutron's negative magnetic moment. Although the, the N-27 are responsible for most of the neutron's magnetic moment, they are spread out over such a large area that their charge density would show up very weak compared to the neutron's centre. Another representation of a neutron's charge plane shown in C. This is meant to represent a slice of any diameter. Vertical distance of charge density, not spatial distribution. Above the axis is positive charge, below the axis is negative charge. Positive areas should equal negative areas. The gap at the center represents the limitation of measurement equipment which was used circa 1960s. More accurate equipment could well show a widening of that gap in the centre. I think illustration D gives the best way of visualising or modelling a neutron. The oblique view shows a neutron's electric field at an angle. Its intense positive core is surrounded by an even stronger but less intense negative field that extends out to about 1.2 fm. After that, there is a weak positive charge indicated by the red circumference that is surrounded by a weak negative charge and goes out to about 5 fm. The whole assembly, of course, is surrounded by a magnetic field. When it's N27th harmonic oscillation, the neutron is physically much larger than the proton. That is due to the very weak electric field surrounding it. It shows up experimentally when neutrons are used to measure the diameter of nuclei. Nuclei, being made up of protons and neutrons, have this weak negative charge surrounding them. When a neutron approaches the nucleus, those weak negative charge rings interact, pushing the neutron away a little. That shows up as the neutrons detecting the nuclei as larger than when detected by high energy charged particles fired at them. Neutrons have often been described as neutral protons. They have the same central positive charge, are made of the same components and have very similar properties. So why wouldn't a neutron have the same eternal stability as a proton? When describing the general properties of all particles, I mentioned that charged particles were made from rotating circularly polarised protons, 
while neutral particles were made from rotating plane polarized photons. With rotating photons circularly polarized, like electric and magnetic fields overlap, reinforcing each other. The neutrons rotating plane polarized photons superimpose opposite charges of magnetic fields on each other, making it less stable. The other great internal difference is the intrinsic spin h-bar associated with the rotating photon that is the particle. Protons being charged particles have it. Neutrons being neutral particles don't have it. The conservation of intrinsic h-bar angular momentum in the proton's rotating photon is even stronger than the conservation of half h-bar angular momentum of those particles. They combine to make the free proton a stable particle, while a free neutron is less stable. Observations, of course, suggest that when a neutron is bound, it is just as stable as a proton. Other aspects of the neutron will be covered when I discuss nuclear binding and the structure and protons of nuclei. Now it is time to have a look at the fourth stable particle, the neutrino. The existence of neutrinos was first postulated by Pauli to explain the difference in the product when neutrons decay to protons and electrons. The neutron has zero charge and spin half h-bar. The proton has positive charge and spin half h-bar. The electron charge minus is negative charge and spin half h-bar. While there is conservation of charge, there are two half h-bars arising out from only one spin half h-bar. That required another particle to counteract the extra spin half h-bar. That is done by another particle with opposite spin, namely minus half h-bar. That particle is called a neutrino, Italian for little neutron, by Fermi. Neutrinos were first discovered by Raines and Cowan working at the Savannah River site. Despite its discovery in 1956, neutrinos still remained mysterious particles whose existence seems to defy logic. When a neutron decays to a proton, the mass difference between that of the neutron and proton and the electron is about 0.78085 MeV per C squared. That provides ample opportunity for a neutrino to have mass. Careful measurements of decay carried away by particles after the neutron decayed has shown the amount of energy left to comprise the rest mass of the neutrino was less than 1 EV per C squared. Now, it was bad enough that a point particle like an electron could have the same spin as a nucleon that was almost 2,000 times its mass. How could something with one millionth the mass of an electron have the same property as a nucleon, which is a further 2,000 times more massive? Suggesting spin with angular momentum seems totally preposterous. However, we really need to look at it under this model. Spin half bar gives it particle properties. Zero charge means it is a plane polarized photon making two revolutions within its wavelength. But how to work out its mass? Well, there are three ways. One is to measure the energy difference between the neutron and the emitted particles after the neutron decays. So far, the most accurate measurements give an answer of less than 1 eV per C squared for the anti-electron neutrino. Another way to measure it is, is how long does it take for a neutron to decay once it starts the process? That is the time it takes for the neutron to emit the electron and neutrino. The electron's frequency is approximately 10 to the 20 hertz. It would be emitted in that time. Measured results indicate that the electron takes approximately 10 to the minus 10 seconds to decay once the process has started. Under this model, that corresponds to the time for a neutron to emit the neutrino and convert to a proton after having already emitted the electron. That gives the neutrino a frequency of 10 to the 10 hertz, a mass of about 4.5 times 10 to the minus EV per C squared, and a wavelength of about 30 millimeters, and a radius of about 2.5 millimeters. Hmm. Yes, okay. But before accepting or rejecting that answer, one should always do some more calculations. Observations have shown that neutrinos from supernova events within our galaxy arrive at Earth within about a second after the arrival of photons from the same event. This slide shows the neutrino fluxes from different sources. Their energies range over some 22 orders of magnitude. Their flux densities range over some 32 orders of magnitude. 
But it does show that neutrinos from supernova bursts have energies of the order of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 dV. So, so rearranging the special relativity correction for mass with velocity gives V over C equals the square root of 1 minus M naught squared over MV squared, where MV is the mass of the neutrino at velocity V. With such a low primary mass, the mass of an energetic neutrino is essentially its energy. And this gives a 1 AV neutrino a speed of 99.999% C. A neutrino with 10 MeV energy would have a speed close to 1 times 10 to the minus 11, all times C. So neutrinos can have mass and still travel very close to the speed of light. There are approximately 3.15 times 10 to the 8 seconds per year. It doesn't take too much to realize that at a speed of 1 minus 10 to the minus 11 times C, a photon would be about a second ahead of a 10 to the 7 EV neutrino of mass 5 times 10 to the minus 5 EV per C squared after both had traveled about 50,000 light years. So that is the third mechanism of calculating the mass of, of neutrinos. Measure the time delay between photons and neutrinos arriving at Earth from supernova events. Determine the distance from Earth to the supernova event and use the special relativity corrections to get the rest mass. That may give you a range of answers, but they'll always be around the 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 4 EV per C squared range. So what does that tell us about electron neutrinos? The neutrino has an opposite spin to the electron, so it's called an anti-electron neutrino. It is a plain polarized photon making two revolutions per wavelength. That gives it the properties of zero charge and spin as angular momentum I omega equals half h bar. Yes, despite an exceedingly small mass, it can still have the same angular momentum as a photon by making up for it in the distance. So it gives it the properties at rest are uh, mass approximately 10 to the minus 4 EV per C squared, wavelength approximately 30 millimeters, radius approximately 2.5 millimeters. Speed when moving is approximately C for energies greater than 10 to the minus 2 EV per C squared. That raises the question, if they are so large, why can they travel through anything and be so hard to detect? The first thing to realize is that any hoop with its whole mass traveling in a radius at the speed of light is one very powerful gyroscope. For their mass, neutrinos are among the world's most powerful gyroscopes. The only thing more powerful is a circularly polarized photon of energy less than 10 to the minus 5 EV per C squared. I'm not exactly sure any of those exist. So, the powerful gyroscopic effect means that trying to get one of them to change its direction is rather difficult. E electrons have no way of absorbing them. In order for a nucleon to absorb a neutrino, the neutrino must strike the nucleon at exactly the right angle and exactly with its leading point. Its small mass means that its point is very small, and if it misses that spot, it will pass straight through the nucleon and be unable to react with it. An isolated neutron, a rotating plane polarized photon, is unstable. So why should not an isolated neutrino, also a rotating plane polarized photon, be stable? The answer is rather quite simple. There is nothing below it to which it can decay. At 2.7 degrees K, the background temperature of space corresponds to an energy of 10 to the minus 4 eV. So with an average mass of 5 times 10 to the minus 5 EV, there aren't many energy levels but lower than that. Poor old neutrino is stuck with what it's got. It's got nowhere to go, except very fast at the speed of light. It can't decay to anything else. So if moving particles are spiraling photons, what keeps neutrinos intact? Well, well conservation of angular momentum is a big consideration. I mean, consider an electron. Its half h-bar means that the whole mass of the electron at rest is rotating at the speed of light at radius 1.93 times 10 to the minus 13 meters. That makes it a very powerful gyroscope. 
On top of that, the H-bar internal spin of a photon is its whole center of mass rotating once per wavelength. That is also a very powerful gyroscopic effect. The two of them combined mean that once established, it takes a lot to break them. Supporting that is the overlapping and hence reinforcing effect of the electron's magnetic field. On top of that, the electron and proton have no resonant frequencies at lower values. If by some means they did unravel, they have nowhere else to go. There's nothing below they can unravel to. So if you want to know what force is strong enough to cause huge angular momentum of photons to rotate once in one direction with its intrinsic spin h-bar and another way twice to give angular momentum half h-bar, think no more than the particles electric and magnetic fields. At the mechanical level which they are produced, they are very powerful forces that can twist and curve photons to emerge as a single particle. Before finishing this topic, I want to make one further comment about these particles. They are all oscillations in rotating photons that make two revolutions per wavelength. The neutron does not contain a proton, an electron and a neutrino within it. They are electromagnetic oscillations. Under the appropriate circumstances, they can emit or absorb other rotating or linear photons and change their state to another, perhaps more stable state. For neutral particles, it is only their spin half h-bar as the plane polarized photon rotates twice in its wavelength. They are not as stable. In the case of a neutron, it has a lower stable frequency below it, namely protons. An isolated neutron is unstable. An isolated neutrino has no energy level to which it can decay, so it's also stable. Well, thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please direct them to jgw at quicycle.com. He will pass them on to me and we will announce a future time and date and when I will answer all of, you, all of your questions. Thank you for your patience.